we're gonna get, get started here in just a couple of minutes. So if you want to find a seat, find a seat. And if not, then don't. So I just want to let you know we're gonna get started here in a couple of minutes. Alrighty. So um, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, this is our first meetup here at Ogilvy Great Space. Um, we're gonna give them the floor in a couple seconds, but I just wanted to. Welcome everybody, say thank you for coming and go over a few quick business items. The first of course is the agenda. We are already through the welcoming and food. Uh, we typically go around the room, let everybody introduce themselves, et cetera, et cetera, but since we're jamming in so much really good content tonight, we're gonna not do that. We're just gonna go with two rounds of, two rounds of awesomeness um, and then the wrap up and drinks at not really Taco Mac, um, but somewhere, <laughs> we'll figure out where that is. Uh, so, we always start by thanking our sponsors. Uh, we've got the Sabah Group, uh, which is a company that I work for. Uh, they do development managed services and hosting. CCCI is a technical recruiter. They host uh, the workshop.js meetups. And then we've got Ogilvy, who is a fresh, brand new sponsor. And Brian's going to say a couple words uh, on their behalf. Thanks, Randall. Um, so, my name is Brian Fletcher, and I'm the development manager here. Is that feeding back? Um, I'm the development manager here at Ogilvy in Atlanta, and um, who else here from Ogilvy, raise your hand. So if you have any questions about you know, where the bathroom is or whatever, uh, just find those people, um, or about Ogilvy as a company maybe. Um, now we have actually launched a few applications using Backbone, so we're all very excited to hear about, you know, um, you know hear from Brian and Pamela about Backbone and their experience with it. Um, and we really just, we're happy to have you here in this space. Um, we've been here since January. Um, Ogilvy Atlanta has been up in Roswell for the past five years, I wanna say. Um, but we're very happy to be downtown and as, be part of the, you know, the web development community here. So uh, if you have any questions about you know, what we do here at Ogilvy, please you know, reach out to myself or, this is Todd Matthews, our tech director over here. All right, thanks. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much, Brian, for everything that you've done so far, especially in mean, the spaces. It's phenomenal. The views are great. Um, so, Pamela and Brian are going to be talking tonight, um, and they are going to be essentially lighting a candle. And this is a quote that I always say that is totally lame, but it's totally true. Um, if, if you have some knowledge, share that. You know, you're not going to lose anything by sharing with it. So if you want to share some knowledge or if you want to get involved really in any capacity, send an email to uh, present at atlantajobscript.com and we will uh, definitely make sure that that, that, that happens. Um, some upcoming events, we've got our workshop.js happening on November 5th. Again, that's going to be at CCCI. It's a smaller, more intimate, hands-on type workshop, hence the name. Um, which is really cool, you should check it out. It's limited to 25 people, so RSVP sooner than later. Uh, we've got our November meetup happening on November 15th. Don't have a topic, don't really know what's gonna happen, but something cool's gonna happen, because um, that's, that's how we deliver all the time. Um, and then last but not least for the year, we've got the holiday party, which currently is being thrown between the 13th and the 20th of December, and that's gonna be a collaborative type event with, uh, with other meetup groups. Um, the next couple slides are about a competition that's being put on by Microsoft and their Windows 8 app challenge. A lot of you guys probably know Glenn Gordon, who is a developer evangelist for Microsoft, um, and he's kind of come to us with this contest that he wants to do, and he's got these slides that he wanted me to show you that have a lot of words on them. <laughs> and so it describes exactly how the contest is gonna work, but the cool thing, I think, is the, the prizes. Um, I don't know if first prize or second prize is better, but you've got the Windows tablet and the $500 gift card. Um, can we not afford that part? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so this is, I suppose, um, kind of what you're doing. And then there's another slide here about the sort of judging criteria. We'll make these available online. Um, we're going to use the meetup group to kind of disseminate knowledge, or knowledge, not really knowledge, but sort of information about the competition. If you have any questions, you can post them there. Um, and you can always reach out to Glenn um, on Twitter or his email. I believe it's like Glenn Gordon at Microsoft.com. Uh, and then the plan is to have people work on stuff and then at next month's meetup present what they've done and then somebody will be lucky enough to win a um, Windows tablet PC uh, or a $500 gift card. So that's, that's it for me for now. We're gonna dive right into the, uh, to the awesomeness. Um, and so the first 
presenter this evening is going to be Pamela Fox, who is a uh, celebrity in town from uh, San Francisco. Uh, she is presenting also at uh, Remix South, which is going on, uh, I believe, the next couple days here. And if you haven't registered, you can uh, with a nice promo code of JS at Remix. You save, I think, like $25 or percent, one or, one or the other. Um, so Pamela uh, is <laughs> coming from San Francisco, uh, went to school out there, currently works for Coursera, which is a really cool idea, um, to, to say the least. Uh, they've really sort of revolutionized the way that people are educated. And I know I've taken part of a couple of the courses that they offer, um, and it's really cool. So without further ado, I'd like to have Pamela do her thing. We want our code to be a beautiful place 
that you look forward to being in, right? Uh, I'll admit that at Coursera, we do have a legacy code base that's PHP. Um, and you know, this is what happens when you have your grad students write the prototype, and then the prototype becomes a thing that's powering like 200 courses. Uh, and uh, you know, there is some frameworks that are built on PHP, and, and I imagine they're pleasant to work with. And my brother's actually a Drupal programmer, but this PHP code is really not that pleasant to work in. It's a custom framework that they made up, um, you know, in between doing homework. And uh, it's, it's really not that fun. So when I'm inside that PHP code base, I get kind of like, my head gets kind of, you know, it's like a cloudy and not happy. And then when I leave, I don't feel good about it. I want to feel like excited about entering a code base and I want to feel good about working in it and feel like I'm, I'm not adding mess to things. I want to feel like I'm adding, you know, little pieces of a, a beautiful puzzle or something like that. Um, so you want your code base to be a happy place. So that's why we use a framework. Um, so why Backbone in particular? There's lots of different frameworks out there, but uh, the main reasons that we're using Backbone is to give structure to our code, right? So that we can actually split it across those 250 files and have that structure make sense. So that we can have classes and subclasses and all of that. So we can share, um, you know, not have redundant code and share code um, to have the modularity. And Backbone also provides the persistence layer to, for your, your data, your models, some common services like the routing and the history management. And it also just comes along with a lot of best practices about how to do this and that, and a community of people that are contributing to this knowledge base. And working with something that has a community is, is actually really important. When I, whenever I check out a library and I'm deciding whether to use the library, like I look at, uh, I'll look at their recent commits on GitHub, like how active is that project. I'll look at the issues, I'll look at the pull requests, and I'll see, are people responding to the pull requests? Are they merging the pull requests? Are they saying, hell no, you're stupid? And sometimes they do, and when I see that, I'm like, mm, I don't know if I want to use this, because I don't want them to call me stupid. Um, so you want to, like, whenever you're using something, you want to have a good community um, that contributes to making it better and, and will help out when something isn't quite working. Um, so here for a background intro, background is a lightweight MVC framework. Um, I know a lot of people, I guess, use have used MVC frameworks outside of JavaScript, and then they come to Backbone and they compare it to that. Uh, I actually never used an MVC framework outside of uh, outside of JavaScript. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but I never did. So Backbone was actually my first introduction to doing that at all, right? Um, so I know a lot of people probably compare it to Rails, but Never did Rails, so I'm not going to compare it to Rails. Those of you who did can do that in your head. <laughs> so what do we have? We have models, and we actually have models and then collections of models, and those represent your data. Um, we have views, which we use for visualizing our models and collections. And we have routers that help us figure out what views to load in and which models and collections those views should actually be doing. <laughs> and then in between everything, we have these events, right? So when a model changes, we can get notified in the view and update something in the view or vice versa in the collection. Um, and so everything is communicating across everything with different sorts of events. Uh, so let's look at an example of uh, if we want to model books, right? So if we have a database of books and we want to model that, so we extend the backbone.model. We can provide some defaults, and these are default values for the attributes that we want set on the books, title, author, owned. Um, we'll set a display string function, and this function will return back this nice pretty version. Um, and so you can see here, we have getters and setters for the attributes. And so instead of doing like this.title, which is what you would do if it was a JavaScript object, you're doing this.getTitle. So you have to, or at least you're supposed to, go through the backbone accessors in order to get at those attributes. Um, and it's more important when, when you're actually setting it that you go through the backbone setter. So if I have this function mark is owned, I say this dot set own true. So that goes to the backbone setter. Uh, instead of doing like this dot own equals true, you have to do this dot set own. And that's important because backbone needs to know when you're setting stuff so that it can trigger the right events and notify people that something's actually changed. Because very often, one of the advantages of using these frameworks is being able to easily subscribe to find out when things change about your models uh, without having to know exactly you know, what caused that change. You just want to know that they changed. Uh, so if we want to create a new book, we'll just do new book, and we can just pass in those attributes that we want, right? I've been reading a lot of Asimov lately, so I see a lot of references to that. He's awesome. 
Uh, okay, and then we have collections of models. So there we just extend back in collection, and uh, we'll tell it which model we want it to use. Um, and then if we want to make a collection, we can just pass in an array of models here. Uh, so once again, we're just specifying that models with attributes. Um, so this is showing all using models in your client. But of course, normally your data is actually coming from a server and being stored on a server. So Backbone makes it very easy to get data from a server and store data on a server, and it follows very restful principles for doing that. Um, you can go outside of those principles, but it's better not to. So we'll take, we'll take a look at that. So what I didn't point out is in that backbone.model, uh, we actually defined a URL as well, and this is our API URL. So this is the URL that Backbone will hit behind the scenes in order to interact um, with this model, this back, books model API. So here we have the model definition. So now, if I want to, um, this should be fetch actually, but if I want to fetch the book with ID 12 from the uh, from our database, I'll so do book new book and then book dot fetch, um, and then that will end up doing an HTTP GET to that URL, and it'll just return back the JSON. So Backbone expects a RESTful API that consumes JSON and outputs JSON. Uh, now if we want to, uh, that changes the wrong place. Okay, so let's say we wanted to change that book on the server. So here, it's horrible JavaScript. So book.mark is owned, and then book.save. <laughs> Typos. Um, so what did that end up doing is an HTTP put to slash API slash book slash 12, so it'll automatically know to put the ID after this because that's the restful way of doing things. And it'll send the new changed JSON, right? So it's keeping track of all the current attributes, and when you do this, remember that that's set owned true behind the scenes. And so then anytime you press save, um, it's going to go and send this new JSON to the server, and then your server is expected to handle that JSON and propagate the results to the database. Uh, so, but it's a very pretty way of, of doing things, and those of you who like RESTful APIs, it hopefully looks very clean. Uh, now, the same thing with collections is that these also follow the RESTful API. So, if we create a new book collection and we just want to get all those books from the server, so we basically want to collect, we want to, uh, we want that book collection object to, to store all that information from the server. So, we create the collection, we fetch, and that'll do an HP get again, and this time it just returns back an array of JSON. Right? And it'll just populate that collection, and then it'll trigger uh, various events. So in a collection, it's triggering the reset event, usually. Um, so you could listen to that event if you wanted to know when there was actually data in your collection that you could use. And then if we wanted to create a uh, new book, we could say mybooks.create, pass in the attributes of the book, and that'll just do a post to that URL and pass in the JSON of the, of the book. Um, and then, you, of course, your database will handle it. So it's pretty cool the, the way Backbone structures this, and I, I quite like it. It's, it's really nice in a, in a universe where we can actually create APIs that look like this. It's not always possible to create you know, these beautiful, perfect RESTful APIs, but when it is, it's really clean and it, and it works really well. And so this is what Backbone recommends as the, as the best practice. And is, like when I, I sometimes use the adjective backbone-y, so when I say backbony, like this is like incredibly backbony, right? If you do stuff this way, this is like the most backbony way of structuring your APIs, okay? Uh, it's, you know, I say it's possible to go do it other ways, but this is the recommended way. Um, but that's the thing about backbone is that it is, it's lightweight, it's flexible, so it has these best practices for the ways it thinks you should do things, but if for some reason you need to veer outside of them, you can do that as well. And that's why a lot of people like Backbone, I think, because it, it has opinions, but you could ignore the opinions. <laughs> and that's kind of a, a really good for a framework. All right, so then we have the views. And the views we're going to use to, to uh, actually uh, render this model and collection data out to something that the user can see. So for a view, we extend Backbone view. Um, we can define a template. Uh, maybe we define that using handlebars or Jade templating. And then we define the render function, and the render function will um, go ahead and render the template, passing in the JSON version of the model. So two JSON just returns back an object with all the attributes, passes that into the template, and then saves it into the element. So every backbone view is associated with an element, and backbone typically will just 
create that element for you. And if you want, you can tell it what tag name to use. So here we've said, okay, create an li, and it'll create that li for us. Um, so that'll just give us one li displaying one book. And then if we want to have a list, we have our list view, which is another view. And this one has a tag name of ul. And this also defines the initialize. So this is called when we construct this view, when we create a new book list view. And in here, we're saying this dot collection. So all views um, have either a model, a collection, or both. Um, so this has a collection, and it says we're using the event binding here. And we're saying when we get the reset event, call render. And then we're calling fetch. So what this means is like, all right, you have, a, you have the notion of a collection. Um, whenever that collection changes, we want to call this render function. And now we want to go fetch that collection from the server. So as soon as we call this, this goes out to the server, gets that list of JSON, populates in the collection, and then calls render. So now in render, we can actually go through all the models in the collection. And for each one of them, we'll create a new uh, item view, and then append the result of that item view to this view. Right? So now you can see that you can actually have nested views, and, and this is pretty cool as well. Right? So you can kind of um, mix and match things and more easily than, than you normally could. All right, now finally we have the router, because you want to have a way of actually getting to these views. Um, so typically in the router, you extend back on router, and you define a, a list of routes. So these are URL mappings to functions. And then in the function, you'll typically uh, initialize a, a collection or an item, depending on that particular uh, route. And then you'll create a view. So here, we're creating a new book collection, a uh, new book list view. And then we're rendering the result of that view to the sidebar on the page. Uh, and then finally, we can just initialize this router and tell Backbone to start history. And so it'll actually start, it'll look at your URL, it'll figure out uh, which of the routes correspond to your current URL, and it'll start tracking changes to your URL. Uh, so typically, that's actually hash changes. But if you want it, you can also use the HTML5 history push date API, uh, in which case it actually looks like normal URLs, um, but they're all client-side changes behind the scenes. So that's pretty cool, because now you can have this full web app, which is powered by uh, Backbone, but has like full you know, URLs that look real. They are real. People can share them. People can bookmark them. And they don't actually know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so www.coursera.org is actually a single page web app. Uh, so every URL you go to there, you're not actually going to another URL. It's just a backbone view getting swapped out behind the scenes. And backbone is just monitoring um, the, the, the changes and figuring out what views to do. So that's really neat. And I didn't know that until I started at Coursera. And I was like, oh my god, this is, this is magical. So cool. <laughs> um, so that's the basics of Backbone. Backbone also kind of comes bundled or goes along with um, two other libraries. So one of them is jQuery. So who here is used jQuery? Who here is proud of your license? <laughs> no, I mean, it's cool. And resume is cool. Um, but <laughs> I never liked dollar signs. That was my big thing against jQuery. Uh, so we have, you know, of course, standalone jQuery. And, but jQuery is also easily used with backbone. So in every view, you'll have this dot dollar $L. Uh, so dollar $L refers to the element. And it's you can also do just this dot $L without the dollar, and that would be the DOM node version of it. But dollar $L is the jQuery object. And so that makes it very easy to manipulate this jQuery object um, using all our favorite DOM methods. So typically, you're doing something like, you know, often I'll have this dot dollar $L dot find, and then adding some HTML. Um, or even a shortcut for that, if you just do this dot dollar and then pass in the selector, that's actually the same thing as this. So this is what I most often am doing in here. So that's convenient. Um, and hopefully you end up, you know, I, I hated my apps when I felt like my apps were all jQuery and there was dollar signs like everywhere and, you know, you start having nightmares about too many dollar signs. Uh, but now with Backbone and with templates, like I have, yeah, I still do a lot. I still have to do some DOM manipulation in my views. Like, you know, stuff happens. You gotta, you gotta work with the DOM. But I have much less DOM manipulation going on, and it's much easier to read, right? Um, so it's convenient that it's easy to use that when you need it. Uh, and Backbone also comes with underscore. It's actually kind of written on. 
Uh, it's kind of written on top of underscore two, I think. They're basically, they're both got by the same guys, by document cloud. Um, and underscore, who's used underscores? Maybe I should ask you. Oh, okay. Well, if you've used backbone, you have to use underscore probably. <laughs> um, so, oh, underscore is a bunch of utility functions um, for just doing nifty things that actually JavaScript should really provide for us. And actually, the next version of JavaScript does actually provide a lot of this for us. Um, so they tend to mimic that. So you have stuff like iterating, like you know, for each uh, in an array. Uh, so Java, the next JavaScript does have for each, but um, you know that's not available in all browsers. Uh, finding, filtering, map, reduce, uh, flatten, union, unique, pluck, where, reject. Uh, I haven't memorized all of them yet. So there's a long list of all these functions. Um, there's some ones that are for like stuff, like, nice stuff like binding and throttling and debouncing. So those are all in underscore. So it's a lot of nifty stuff that eventually we're not going to need to be in underscore because JavaScript's going to give us all of it um, out of the box. But we need to wait like a year or two for that. Um, now the convenient thing about um, underscore is that every backbone collection has uh, the, these collections and arrays functions available on it. So any collection, you can say collection dot underscore method, and you can use it. The weird thing about this is that these don't return collections, they return arrays. Um, so that's quite counterintuitive, so you actually have to turn it back into a collection uh, afterwards, most of the time. It's really odd and I hate it. Um, but it's still, it's Okay, um, so this isn't something you have to use with Backbone, but it is something that we do use with Backbone, and that's Require.js. So Require.js is a great way um, of ma managing JavaScript dependencies, right? So you have this one view, and this view uses this model, this model, uses this JavaScript utility library, and it uses this jQuery plugin, right? And you want to be able to say, like, all right, every time I need these views, I also need these files. Um, and you don't want to have to think too hard about that. And Require.js makes it easy to do that. All right, so you see here, this is, um, this is actually a very typical view for us. Um, so we start off by defining, and this is a list of our dependencies. Um, that's a syntax error. But, so we depend on jQuery, underscore, and backbone. And then you'll pass in these, um, you know, the, what, uh, the variables, however you want to refer to them in the function. So jQuery, I want to refer to using dollar, underscore. I want to refer to using underscore. Um, it took me a long time to realize why underscore was named <laughs> <laughs> and I also have my bin setting so that it does the thing where it does a line on each line you're on, which makes it really hard to use with underscore because you can't really tell the difference between an underscore and a line. So don't do that either. It's a pro tip. This is an underscore. Um, and then backbone, we get pass in as backbone. So then we can use um, you know, any of the, the um, objects that these libraries output. We can use them inside this function here, right? So we have backbone, we have our underscore, we have our jQuery. Um, so this is pretty cool because uh, we only bring in the you know the global variables that we need, and um, we're not bringing in any libraries that we don't need, right? So we use require.js across all of our views at, at Coursera, um, and then we use uh, r.js for actually um, putting together our final build when we go to production. And normally, what we do is for our front page. We'll have everything that that front page depends on, and then we'll also um, specify that we'd also like to bring the dependencies for the most common views that people go to after the front page. So that gets a nice optimized front page experience um, and browsing from there. So required yes and backbone work pretty well together. All right, so now I want to talk specifically about how we use backbone at Coursera, um, since that was kind of more general stuff. So. This is more specifically like give you an actual feel for uh, our use case. As I was saying, like Backbone, it's you can use it a lot of different ways, and even within inside, even within Coursera, we've managed to use it different ways in every uh, every front end we've used it for, uh, which is cool because we're learning each time and we're figuring out which ways work. Um, but it's also kind of weird when you put it between them. Um, so first we do some backbone customizations across the board for, for all of our use. Uh, so we do have a, a custom router that just does some stuff we need to have done. Um, also takes care of some IE bugs. Uh, we have a custom region manager and the region manager makes it easier for us. That's basically view managing 
um, and it makes it easier, easiest for us to swap out uh, views on the page. So if we only need to, very often we'll keep the header view always there, and we'll just swap out the body view and replace it with a new view. Um, so this is something we built the region manager for, and it's actually something that you would think that Backbone would maybe provide out of the box, but it doesn't. So we have this region manager, and that just makes it a better user experience, right? You should, if you don't have to, you know, swap the DOM out under a user, you shouldn't do that. Uh, only change what you have to. That's the whole idea behind the, the way we're doing websites now. And we also have a custom API layer. Um, this API layer takes care of doing CSRF tokens. Um, it takes care of actually showing loading messages um, and uh, does a few other things as well that are dependent on our server. And it basically wraps on top of the backbone API. All right, so here's our three front ends that I'll talk about. So we have what I call home or dub dub dub, and that's the what you guys maybe are most familiar with, where you go and you see the courses. If you've been. Um, and then we also have two admin interfaces, which you probably have never seen. Hopefully, we did permissions correctly. <laughs> uh, so home, right? Um, this is our course catalog view, and this was actually the first front end that we used back then for. And this was built um, before I joined the team originally. Um, and this was also the first front end we built after the PHP code base, right? Um, so this is our kind of our experiment, our foray into the world of let's build a real modern app. Um, so you know, made the decision to go with Backbone here, um, but we didn't use it in the best way ever. Right. Uh, so here's our models, right? We have uh, topic, which is courses to you guys. Uh, we have university, we have course, which is sessions to you guys. Uh, we unfortunately made a bad database naming scheme when we came up with the databases. Uh, so we have topics and courses, and we actually present them as courses and sessions to the user, which is really confusing because basically every time we're having a discussion at work, at the beginning of the discussion we have to say, okay, we're going to use the course session nomenclature for this discussion. Uh, so that's horrible. So make sure when you're naming your databases that you just pick the right names, right? Because <laughs> This oh, it gets so confusing. Uh, so and then we have users, right? Those are the only models we need for this. Um, so here's a sample uh, model for a topic. Um, so here's the thing: when we were making this this um, this site, we didn't actually have proper APIs um, for that we were interacting with, and we certainly didn't have very RESTful APIs. Uh, so we couldn't follow the backbone way of doing things. So instead of doing the whole define a URL and fetch from that URL, we instead just uh, wrote these sync functions on all the models, and the sync functions are responsible for fetching the information about that model, and each of them has kind of a different API. Um, and that's important because these were our early APIs, and we hadn't put a lot of thought into them, they weren't very restful, and, and so this is what we had to do. So we have our sync function, which goes out and gets um, information about a topic, um, you know, sets some loading message, and then uh, finally calls a callback. Uh, then we've got our collections. And so once again with the collections, the thing to notice here is that uh, we didn't have good APIs, so instead of getting to use collection.fetch, we instead use retrieve, which is a function that we define for each of our collections, and that function is responsible for going out, um, doing a get request, getting back that information, and calling a callback, right? So if you're thinking to yourself like, oh, I don't have a RESTful API, I, I can't use Backbone, uh, it's certainly not the case. There's many ways of using Backbone when you don't have a RESTful API. This is the way we did it. Um, there's, there's a few other uh, workarounds as well, or not even workarounds, because it's totally cool not to, not to use um, Fetch the way they do it. Um, and then we have views. So we have lots and lots of views, uh, and we split it up into different folders, and each folder has its own CSS or stylus and its own templates and, and views. Um, so here's like a sample view. So uh, we can see this is, if we think of it in terms of regions, this top region is our, is our uh, header view and our header region, um, and this is our main body region, and that's where we swap the views in and out of using our region manager. So catalog body is a view, and then this is just a template that gets repeated for every topic in the, in the collection. Uh, and then in the router, um, we've got quite a few routes, but this is an example route. So 
in the router, um, we define our, you know, where we're going to. Uh, and then we usually do some stuff like we'll actually check to see if the user is authenticated because sometimes we want to serve a radically different view for an authenticated user versus an unauthenticated user. So we could check that in the view, but it's better to do it here. Um, so in this case, like we check if you're authenticated for this account page, and if not, you just get navigated to home. So we have many views that simply navigate you to home if you're not authenticated because there's no point in loading in that view that you know has no information for you. Uh, and then if you are authenticated, then we go out and actually fetch your topics first. So sometimes we decide to call our APIs before we load in the page, just for performance reasons. And finally, we'll use our region manager to load in a particular uh, backbone view here. All right, so that's um, home. So we did that, and I mean, it's been working, but we're not you know, particularly happy with the way we did those APIs. Um, but it was cool to actually have an experiment to, to see how it worked, right? So the first time you use Backbone, or any time you use Backbone, it may not be the perfect way, um, but it's a good experience. Uh, so now this is our site admin. So for our home experience, we have all these courses and universities and topics, and we need people to give us that information. And since these are all coming from universities, we have to have an admin interface for them. And we wanted to have a fairly easy to use admin interface. Um, so we actually started with Django Admin. Anyone with Django people here? A few? Okay. So we started with Django Admin, and it was kind of like just a fancier version of PHP and Admin, I would say. Um, so I, it really wasn't the nicest interface in the world. And from a code perspective, it was really horrible, because it was like mixing Python and JavaScript and CSS. And it was one of those things where I'd come out of the code base and be like, oh, this is gross. Uh, <laughs> So I didn't like it. Um, so instead, I said, "All right, let's let's rewrite this and let's write it, you know, using our thick web app approach, wrapping around a RESTful API." And and I was like, "Wow, this might be my opportunity to actually use Backbone the right way." Um, and I managed to do it. So Site Admin runs off a full Backbone RESTful API output from Django, um, and it really uses Backbone the way it's kind of meant to be used. Uh, so you can see here, this is just like the dashboard for all the stuff you could be administering. Uh, so for models, these basically correlate to stuff in our database and are similar to the models um, we saw for DubDub, so topic and course and university, and then we have different sorts of admin levels. Um, but then what I do is I have, I extend backbone.model to create this class admin model, uh, which I reuse for all of those, and so admin model has all the normal backbone model stuff, but also defines stuff like field sets. So these are which fields um, the admin should actually be able to edit and information about those fields, um, columns, their display name, and a few other things. So here's an example of a staff admin model. So this just, just when you want to create like a new instructor, um, you'll create, you'll use this model here. So we have a display name, which is just the email, field sets, and this is our list of fields. So we'll have a name, and this actually corresponds to the, the attribute on the model, so user, official title, universities, and then we have a type, and this corresponds to a kind of a, a UI widget, like a form widget. So we have text, select to, or select to search, which is a nice little Ajax search interface, and then whether it's read only and some other stuff like that. So this information is used in my views in order to build up forms automatically. Um, it's actually, for any of you familiar with Django Admin, it's very much inspired by Django Admin, where you define the field sets that should be editable on a model and the way they should be edited, and then it's easy to build up an admin interface for them. Because I wanted to really easily be able to just add in a new model and instantly have a form, right? That was my goal, because I didn't know how big and crazy this thing was going to get and how much stuff we'd be admitting. So then we have our views, um, and the main view for models is this one, the model admin page view. Um, and it's composed of uh, several views inside of it. So we have the fields view, and the fields view just visualizes all the fields that we just looked at for a model. And depending on the type of the field, it'll use a different view. So if we have like a type text, uh, that would be this one here, the text input view. If I see type checkbox, I'll use this view. If I see type, um, there's another text here. If I see type select two, I'll use this one. Uh, so I can easily map between the field sets and different views. Um, and that just makes it easy to put together these forms. Uh, so then behind the scenes when I'm saving the models, uh, and this is actually looking like the staff model we had earlier, it's that very RESTful API that I was talking about where you get the instructor, you get back that JSON, 
and then you put instructor to uh, update or you post it, create a new one. Um, so everything is JSON in, JSON out. Uh, we also have collections, and these are similar to find a few things on them. Um, and then the collections we just visualize in these views here, right? So there's an iterate through the models, and I have a few different ways of visualizing collections depending on how you're browsing. Uh, and then finally, there's a router. And so the only thing interesting about the router is that um, it'll look at your cookie to determine what kind of admin you are, and based on that, it'll show you particular models, right? Because some models are only editable by some people. Now, of course, I don't enforce this only in JavaScript. Everything that's enforced in the client is reinforced by the backend um, because my backend team would kill me if I didn't do that. Because <laughs> so, obviously, you, you know, you, you can't just be enforcing this in the client, right? Um, so the front end just reinforces uh, the back end. If the user managed to go to a collection that they weren't allowed to go to, then uh, they would actually get an error because the API would return a 403, right? Um, so sometimes you have to duplicate some logic across your front end and back end for stuff like this, but it's not so much. All right, so finally we have course admin. So uh, we also have you know these full courses that you take once you pick a course, and each of those courses have lectures and quizzes, and those all need to be administered by the instructor. Um, once again, we want to have a nice, easy to use interface because these instructors. They're old. Um, <laughs> I mean, actually, my dad's a computer science professor, so I'm really and old, but I'm sure you can handle it. So. Uh, anyway, one day I'll be an old professor and I'll watch this. So, uh, <coughs> so this is our course edit. Um, so, um, my colleague rewrote this using Backbone. Um, the cool thing about this is that, so this here, okay, this is, I'm oh, talking about that PHP code base. This is our PHP code base. Um, so everything here is output from the PHP template and the framework. Um, but my colleague was put in charge of doing this course admin, and he was like, you know, he really didn't want to do the, the PHP thing. So he figured that he would actually just inject a backbone view inside um, the, the, the PHP code base. So that's what he did. So if you click around to any of these other things, they'll all just output straight PHP templates. But when you click on this particular section, You'll, you'll get a page which loads in a backbone view and uses all this backbone stuff. So that's a cool thing that he showed when he did this, is that we could actually kind of, I call this like a Trojan horse, like we can sneak our way of doing things into this old code base and hopefully eventually we could actually, you know, take it over. Um, but that's the thing, like you can do it just bits at a time. You don't have to replace the whole thing at once, right? And that's always nice when you're looking at frameworks to, to think that you could just Start with one thing. It's always really scary to think about rewriting something from, you know, from scratch when you realize that the new cool framework looks like it would be the perfect thing. Uh, so you can just do bits at a time. Uh, so this is very similar to the site admin. One thing that, um, or a few things are different. So he uses a, uh, a library called Backbone Relational, and Backbone Relational just makes it easy to work with models that have relations to each other. So if you get in a JSON and that JSON describes um, like sections, and, but the sections also have items inside of them, and you want the, those items to get turned into item models, uh, Backbone won't do that for you, but Backbone Relational will. So here, this is our section. Uh, well, first we have the item model, uh, then we have the section model, and it has uh, it's a has many type. Um, there's the the keys, so section dot items. So it'll look for that in the JSON. It'll look for that items list. Um, and then it'll say the related model is item and the collection type. Um, so it's actually able to turn in this turn this JSON, which has the items key in it, into a section model, which has an items collection inside of it, which has item models in it. Um, so that's pretty cool if you're working with an API that outputs related, um, that outputs relational data in that way. Um, another thing he does, which is interesting, is you see this partial update true. So partial update true, actually that means that behind the scenes, instead of doing like an HTTP put to update information, he's doing an HTTP patch. So an HTTP patch means he can actually, he sends partial JSON, JSON. So he's just sending the JSON of the attributes that he wants to change, uh, not all the JSON. Um, and so that's something that we obviously have to support on the server to just take in those attributes. Uh, but it's a pretty neat thing to support because it means that you're only changing this stuff 
um, that you really care about. And Backbone makes it really easy to do because Backbone keeps track of the things that have changed, right? So it knows what things that it actually would need to uh, send to the server. Uh, so that's pretty cool, um, and it's good because it means you also you wouldn't accidentally override stuff that you didn't mean to override, and that's kind of a, a nice thing about using it. Um, I might have accidentally overridden some stuff that I didn't mean to for uh, site admin, so if any of you were one of the 70,000 students that I unenrolled that day, I apologize. Luckily we had backups. <laughs> Uh, so be very careful about what data you're sending to and from APIs, and that's why testing is very important, and I wrote them right out. Um, <laughs> well, it's also good to have good local data, right? I don't have 70,000 data students in my local database. I'm working on that. Um, okay. Uh, so those are our three front ends, and hopefully that gives you a taste of the different ways that uh, we use Backbone, the different ways you can use Backbone, and um, you know, see some of the flexibility in it. Uh, it's certainly not perfect, actually. So with the background relational, uh, we're trying to use this in, in home now to clean up home, um, but it's, it doesn't quite work because what we have is we have, um, we have one API topics, which returns topics with universities. We have another API universities, which returns universities with topics. They can't both use relational. You, um, it's, I mean, theoretically, it could, it could actually work, but because of the way require works, it ends up being that one of them will be undefined. Um, so, I mean, working with relational data is kind of weird and tricky with, with relationships like that. Um, so, yeah, you'll, you'll run into weird stuff like that. There's, there's always weird stuff, but such as life and coding. Uh, so, if you're interested in trying Backbone, what I recommend is not to start with the docs. The docs are a good reference, right? Once you know what method you're looking for, they're a good reference. You can go and look at it. Essentially, it's even better to look at the code. Um, I instead recommend finding a good tutorial. So I, my favorite one is uh, the Backbone Wine Cellar tutorial. Um, I just think it, it, it shows a very simple example. So I would start, start with a tutorial, um, like the Wine Cellar one, and I think that would be much more clear than the docs. The docs doesn't have like a, you know, this is how you start thing. It just goes straight into the, into the reference. Um, and then, you know, you can either port a simple app over, so that's, that's what I did when, when I wanted to learn Backbone. I just spent like a week um, porting a, a, a presentation app over, and uh, it was like, that was like, my first time interacting with MVC frameworks, and like, I was like asking like random people on the street for, for advice about how to structure my models, and uh, <laughs> luckily in San Francisco, every random person on the street is a developer, so it works. <laughs> 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 Uh, and I even like I'll admit like I was crying in the bathroom at one point because I'm like oh my god I can't do it like this NBC thing is crazy. Uh, but then I got over the hump and it's okay and I don't cry that much anymore. <laughs> uh, you could also make an app from scratch, but you may find it more interesting to try and port one, right? So I would start with trying to do something like as backbony as possible to see you know what backbone is like at its ideal, uh, because when you get to using it for actual apps. You may find it hard to use it at its ideal, but it's good to see what, it, what it's meant to be, right, and to go from there. So that would be my recommendation there. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that, you know, Backbone may not be the, the right framework for you. There are a lot of frameworks, um, and they each have their different benefits. Uh, we just had a, a, a guest talk from the guys behind AngularJS, and that's a really cool looking framework, and it, it goes about things a very different way. It's very HTML driven, and it's using attributes and DOM and everything's tied to different parts of the, your HTML. And it looks really cool, but uh, I'm not sure, we haven't decided which part of Coursera we'll rewrite with it yet to see what it's like. But that's the thing, there's a lot of frameworks out there and, um, and people, you know, they have framework wars and they talk about which framework is better and which is worse. But uh, it really depends on what you're doing with them. So I recommend, you know, becoming familiar with them. It takes time to try all of them, but, you know, try a few, see what the things are. Um, see what's important to you, right? If data binding is important to you, like binding your data to the DOM, then I don't recommend, recommend Backbone necessarily because it's actually not really suited for that. Uh, Angular is probably better. Uh, testability, uh, modularity, like figure out what you exactly want in your app. Um, review all your options. There's lots out these days. And there's uh, a lot of tutorials and uh, roundups on them. Um, you can always write your own. Obviously, the people who wrote these frameworks eventually wrote their own because they decided that what was out there wasn't wasn't good. 
Um, but at least try one of these first, just to get the idea of you know what a framework looks like, and because that will inform you writing your own if you really need to. Um, but remember that you won't have the community, and the community is actually important. So you know, good luck in your trials and tribulations, and uh, hopefully you don't cry too much. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
drop downs, all things like that. So it was going to be really, really uh, woofoo like for those that, uh, that have used that. Um, we wanted to have a lot of interactive analytics because our users, like, they, uh, they do thousands and thousands of inspections on equipment uh, every single month. So we have an enormous amount of data coming in from the field. So the web app arm of things was really there to disseminate it. So we kind of needed to have a lot of interactive analytics like Google Analytics that allows people to filter the data and get really involved in it and, uh, and know what's going on with all this stuff. We wanted a robust scheduling and dispatch apps so our users could actually go and say, okay, well, I've got a team of technicians and I want to schedule them out uh, to you know, go across the country to work with different customers and I want to be able to manage their schedules, see who's going where, drag and drop, and you know, all that stuff. We also knew we were going to have like layers and layers of stack dialogues. We have ridiculously complex like industrial themes and different uh, like, like Pam mentioned about like nomenclature with, with people having different naming conventions over things. So we have like tons and tons and tons of configuration, lots of uh, layers of stack dialogues and whatnot. So as you can probably imagine over the last 10 months, we had hundreds of backbone files pile up. I mean, it was a total, total, total nightmare. Uh, talk about like crying. I was like on the verge of committing suicide every single day, and I'm like the, the single developer, right? So I, I have like less challenges than like a bigger team because I can pick like how I decide I want to like organize my files. But it was it was like a total nightmare. So my big realization and conclusion coming out of this is that client side development is really, really, really hard. I mean, there's no getting around it. We don't get enough credit as like JavaScript developers that really difficult stuff, like really rich UI interactions is definitely really, really, really hard to orchestrate. And, but really, I guess my takeaway is that the cutting edge, being on the cutting edge is always really tough and uh, it's tough in other languages as well and JavaScript is hard, but for, for different reasons. Um, it's really not as mature as back-end development. I mean, uh, stateful web development is a relatively new thing, um, and uh, and JavaScript's got some pretty serious maturity problems. It's been like the redhead stepchild for a long time, um, and there's there's a lot more nuanced decisions when you approach stateful uh, web development. There's there's so many more options and so much more power and control available at your disposal that there's many 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 more decisions that you have to make. It you know and, and all kinds of influences like what based on like what backend, what server, and obviously what you're trying to do. So it really takes time to like met through all these different options and figure out exactly like what your approach should be. So that's that's definitely really, really difficult. And you know, as I, as I mentioned, JavaScript development in general has been wrought by a poor, poor, poor past. I mean, for like the last decade, you know, all of us have been doing JavaScript development. It's been it's been absolutely terrible up until recently. And uh, you know, recently a lot of like new patterns and, and improvement stuff has come around. So there's been a huge explosion of uh, of new options, new frameworks that are always coming out. So you know, when we're trying to get involved in this, it can be difficult. You know, just just getting started uh, because there's so many different options, so many different things. And really, exactly like what Pan mentioned, um, there's no one size fits all approach. What what's a good solution for one situation? One type of app that wants to do, you know, certain X, Y, Z is not necessarily going to work for something else. So there's no silver bullet. There's no, you know, one one paper, one framework, one article that we read that suddenly makes gives us all the answers to, you know, how to approach this. And really, all this culminates itself in feeling like JavaScript's really like the Wild West, right? Like there's like not a lot of there's no law and order. There's no there's no tried and true, fast and true examples of how to do things. Um, but you know that's kind of a good thing as well because it's like a vast, you know, wide open field, and we're kind of like pioneers, um, you know, like out on the frontier, and and uh, we're able to have like a large influence over over what happens, and, uh, and 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 experience right now is is really is really like the most important thing. So um, another another takeaway that I have though is that you know there really is uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, I and mean, from all this chaos. You know there is there is good of order, and a lot of you know, good patterns have have emerged. And I just want to share with you guys 
you know, something that, that I read that I now realize is the secret to building large-scale JavaScript apps. And this is one that I really had to learn the hard way. So what is the secret to building large-scale JavaScript apps? The secret of building large apps is never actually build large apps. You have to break your application into small pieces, then assemble those testable bite-sized pieces into your big application. I didn't write this. Justin Meyer did, who's the, the creator, of, uh, creator of the JavaScript NPC. Um, but really, what, 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 does this, what does this mean to us? And what do we do in JavaScript that, uh, that makes this possible? And I really want to take this concept, and I really want to take this idea, and I want to really, I want to apply it to Backbone and give it like a really good hard look. And I think in doing so, we're going to highlight and, ex and expose really the good, the bad, and the really, really ugly parts about, uh, about Backbone development. So there, there are a lot of really good parts, and, and some of this is we like literally just talked about. But obviously, uh, you know, first and foremost, Backbone is a you know, micro NPC framework that's centered around data model driven development. We no longer stick data in the DOM. We use models, we use collections, and then we you know, bind to those types of events to do our rendering and to do updates into our UI. Uh, Backbone is obviously extremely small and lightweight. Uh, Minified, it only comes in at you know, 5.6 kb, which is absolutely tiny. Um, it's very non-opinionated and very customizable, meaning you know you can use uh, a different a different. You, you don't have to use a specific backend. It has it does have to be restful, but you know every every modern like backend framework is going to be able to do that for you. And you can use like different uh, different uh, JavaScript templating language, and there's like a million options: handlebars, mustache, eco, ejs, jade. Uh, I mean, just just an innumerable amount of options. And you can uh, pick and choose you know, what you want to do. And what it's really good at is that it provides us enough building blocks so we can really you know, get started with, with development. Obviously, we have like a router. Uh, we have uh, models and, and collections and, and views. And hey, you know, that, that, that is enough to at least, to at least get started. Um, this is actually probably really the most important thing and was really the, the one reason why I chose Backbone after doing a lot of different research and different frameworks is that there's a huge, solid, vibrant community of, of, uh, of backbone developers. There's tons and tons and tons of plugins. Uh, backbone Relational, we definitely use the hell out of that. Uh, we have like probably 120 models in, in our apps, all of those having sometimes really deep nested relationships. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways, you know, if you need some type of custom behavior, um, that there might be a, a plugin that exists. There's, it's got a solid track record in the sense that there's been a lot of big players that have, that have come on, that have uh, used Backbone successfully, uh, like Pandora and Walmart and like a million other, if you just go to the, the Backbone site. Um, and, uh, and what this means is that there's a really low barrier to entry, right? You can get into uh, to Backbone and start using it. It's not really that difficult uh, by all means, and you, know, you, can, you, can, you can build, a, build an app. But there's a lot of bad parts to Backbone as well. And the first one is there's a tremendous amount of excess boilerplate. What I mean from this is because it's so small, it's not any like high level abstractions that, that Backbone provides for you. It's very bare metal. And even things like rendering of you, which you will do hundreds and hundreds of times, or when you need uh, nested uh, view support, when, when one view needs to render many little views. You'll have to do all of those things yourself, and so you'll get used to writing the same code over and over and over again. There is absolutely no application component tree to Backbone, meaning like there's nothing that's going to help you structure or organize your, your application. I mean, it's totally hands off, and that's kind of cool, but it's really bad because it's totally not opinionated on, on how you should how you, you should um, you should structure things. You you as a developer have to fill in all those blanks. And even though we call Backbone NBC, it's actually not NBC. What, what's the C stand for? Controllers? There's no controllers in Backbones. We have like this weird notion that there's routers, and a router really you know monitors the, the URL the state and you know you pass it in methods and it calls methods but it's 
used to like manage views, and that's like really weird, and there's a lot of couple concerns there. Um, so it doesn't even doesn't even have a controller. Um, real world projects like literally what Payne was talking about require tons of custom code. Um, so that is you know partly if you're not using like a purely RESTful interface, you might have to bridge a lot of those gaps. But even if you are, really like producing a real world application requires a lot of custom code, and so that really brings us like into the ugly parts of, of, of Backbone. Um, because there's so much customization that needs to happen to produce like a real world project, there is a huge propensity to have an unmanageable code base. A code base that just absolutely goes out of control because you know Backbone doesn't doesn't provide enough for you. Um, there's a lot of, like I, as I already mentioned, there's a lot of couple concerns between views and routers that just shouldn't be there. That's part of like the docs that you know, show you that's the way you should be using it. I mean, a router should really only only uh, be responsible for interpreting the URL and you know maybe kicking off you know a, a controller or something, but it shouldn't be responsible for managing views, instantiating views, and then having views I don't know manage themselves or manage other views, and then what about application events and, and events that are emitted from these views? I mean, what what manages all these things? It's it's totally totally screwed up. And honestly, this is this is the worst thing about Backbone, and I see it every single day. And it's kind of like this this hidden plague of, of client side development, and that is that applications, especially Backbone applications, are plagued by zombies. So I don't know if all you guys know what zombies are, but it's really 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 simple to have zombies in, in JavaScript. And what those are is that in Backbone, you know, we're we're being wired up to like model events. So we'll say, hey, this view is managing this model or this collection. And so we're going to say, hey, when this model changes, when a property changes on it, I want you to do something over here. And we'll have you know routers, I guess, in Backbone also do the same thing with views. Like when views emit like a custom event, do something over here. And what happens is in in JavaScript is that when you are binding all these events. To, to objects like models and, and views, or just any JavaScript object, unless you unbind those and unless you clean those up, those objects have a high chance of becoming persistent and never being cleaned up, never being garbage collected by, by JavaScript. So what that ends up happening is a lot, a lot of things, a lot of bad things. Number one is that your views never get cleaned up. So more objects are being created all the time, Old ones aren't being aren't being uh, handled. So your application, as it's being used, um, takes up more and more memory. So we have a classic we have a classic memory leak, and that's never that's never good. You're using up resources, you know, um, you know on the on the user's computer. You're taking up their memory. You can potentially cause crashes. You'll notice like over a period of time, you know, like your application will start getting slower and slower. And the other most common thing is that, especially when we're binding to view events, when those views are going away and they aren't being cleaned up, like generally we would uh, apply like uh, event handlers, like click events and things like that. Like, hey, this view, I want you to listen to this click on uh, this div or this uh, anchor or, or whatever. And when that happens, I want you to do something else. So we're constantly adding new events to the view, but we're never unbinding them. So what will happen is you'll click something, and like JavaScript will literally fire like tons and tons and tons of events that can just take such a long time to like actually propagate through, and it is a totally miserable experience, right? And so to combat this and to get around this, and you really absolutely have to plan for it. You have to have a way that your views are going to be cleaned up. You have to have a way for your for your models to be un unbound, and it's not gonna it's not gonna just you know happen happen by itself. You're gonna have to plan for. Um, and so this is like a pet peeve of mine, but really when I look at like backbone demos, all the backbone demos are just nothing of like what a real application, you know, would probably be. So like in in my like description, I talked about kind of going past the one task apps. I mean like most useful apps that actually do something are much more than like one task. If you're like working for a company or something, you're trying to produce a solution. You're talking about hundreds. Hundreds of tasks that, that something needs to happen, right? Not one, but a lot of the demos are really just focused around like this, you know, quick get in, start using backbone and understand it. But that's that's actually you know really bad for new developers. And this is where I kind of went back to the whole, you know, client side development doing it right is really difficult. And I mean, because there's been such a huge explosion of frameworks, there's a lot of competition. 
So I can kind of understand the need for saying, hey, look, you know, use us. It's really simple. It's really quick. It gets you what you need. You know, so you know you don't move on to something else. But it's kind of like if you've ever looked at Ember. Ember is like the antithesis of a backbone because it, it does like everything for you, and it's really really complex. But honestly, that's that's what we need in order to really to be able to build out large scalable JavaScript applications. I mean, it's hard. It's it's definitely definitely challenging. And we have to be aware of all of these things. So with 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 backbone demos, they're just you know uh, they they provide they provide no real insight for new developers wanting to wanting to get started with backbone. They're going to lead you down a, a path that that ends up you know it's like a it's like a bridge to nowhere, right? Okay, so <laughs> the conclusion of this is that backbone by itself, the components that it offers us is honestly just not very scalable. I mean, I, I can say this firsthand that you know, after after working with Backbone exclusively for probably like, uh, I don't know, five or six months and cramming it and cramming it. I mean, I had routers that were just like hundreds and hundreds of lines long queues with massively complex logic in them that were trying to manage themselves. It was just a, a total, total nightmare. But I have a solution. This is not all just doom and gloom and, and terrible things about Backbone. And you know, after all, you know, even though I'm kind of like ragging on it pretty hard, Backbone, what it offers you, the basic building blocks, are, are absolutely solid. And honestly, if you kind of like read between the lines, it's not really saying it does all of these other things for you. It's saying you have to do them. But if we all had to like reinvent the wheel over and over and over again and provide our own like custom solutions, we'd never get anything done. I mean, you know, uh, client-side development is about like rich interfaces and really like fun, powerful stuff that's impactful to the user. So, is it fun to deal with like zombie views and and handle all of that, all of those uh, those things under the hood? No, it, it, it's 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 not fun at all. So, what I want to introduce to you guys is a framework that sits on top of that though, called Marionette JS, and. Marionette was created by a guy uh, by the name of Derek Bailey, who's one of, if not the most prolific backbone developers. Um, he's written tons and tons of plugins, awesome blog posts about JavaScript and backbone development, and he's probably the single most biggest contributor to um, answered questions on Stack Overflow. Uh, he's produced tons of top uh, like screencast material, and he was recently published on Pragmatic. So this is where Marionette came from. It came from this dude that's it's been in development for uh, for like a year, year and a half now, and uh, so that's cool. But what does Marionette actually offer us, right? So Marionette is a full stack composite application framework built for Backbone. So cool. What does that mean? Well, in this bullet, composite is the keyword here because composite means that it's going to offer you a lot of things but it's built in a way that you can pick and choose which components that you want to use. It doesn't, doesn't force you to use everything. Um, but more often than not, like as you learn about each of these different uh, composite parts, you're, you're probably going to use them, but you don't have to. It's totally optional. And it is literally single-handedly going to give you the ability to scale your applications with a modular event-driven architecture. So one of you know, the things that we talked about or Actually, I didn't even talk about this. That backbone doesn't offer you is really like a way for like your application to communicate with each other, and and in a way to build out your application in a modular fashion. So you can you can um, you can group concerns in, in certain areas um, of uh, of things that need to do similar things and, and, and break it apart. Because remember, the secret to building you know large scale JavaScript applications is about breaking it into smaller parts. So everything lives on its own, and it's and it just plays one role in a bigger and a bigger you know orchestration of of, of, of componentry. Um, it's also going to completely reduce all of the crappy backbone boilerplate for views with with specialized view types. It's going to automatically handle handle those um, those uh, like pedantic uh, render methods. You'll never write like another stupid render method again that's just responsible for putting itself in the DOM and calling to JSON on, on the model. All that's all that's over with, so you can focus on what's really important about your your view, like the interactions and the logic and the changes that need to that need to happen, right? So, this is another huge point. It's got built-in memory management for killing zombies. 
And it doesn't make it impossible to still have zombies in Marionette, but it's going to come with um, with an event binder where you're still going to you know bind to events. Controllers are still going to bind to view events. Views are still going to bind to UI events and model changes and, and update everything. But you're going to use an, an event binder instead. And that's going to be responsible for automatically managing when things need to be closed down. And when they are closed down, it's going to unbind things. So you're not going to have these horrible, horrible memory leaks. And I mean, it just it makes this so absolutely painless to, to do and to handle. Like it's just it's just like a no brainer. Uh, it, it's it, it's a more thing. Um, it's got it's specialized view types allow you to have like nested view support via via layouts and regions. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, in depth in a second. But basically, like you can have, you know, hundreds of views and nested views, and all of that is is perfectly is perfectly uh, uh, it coordinates with with one another just just beautifully. Um, you're going to be able to essentially build out any any type of UI, uh, no matter what, with with the specialized view types that it that it gives you. So, I wanted to kind of give you guys like a visual uh, representation uh, between like the different stacks of, of Backbone and Marionette. And then we're going to like talk about what each one of these does, and I'll show you guys like a demo application of how it all works together. So with Backbone, we have routers, views, models, and templates. Okay, so that is what it's good at, and but that is not nearly, not even close to being enough. With Marinette, we have many, many, many more components, and each component has like a really specialized, well-documented function. So because we have so many more pieces of our application that have you know its own concerns. When you want to go in and often discover, change it, or we'll, we'll know really like where to go because we'll say, okay, well, if I need to do this, if I need to come up with another specialized view, this is where I go from here. Or you know, if I need to change the way that you know the application works, it, uh, I'll do it here. If I want to have like uh, an, uh, an application level way of, of communication, like if the server's down or if, if an operation was complete or not complete. Hey, that's where I would attach like those methods. That's that's where it should live. It should live in the application, and uh, and of course like we'll have as I touched on before, we'll have like an event aggregator object, which is a way that all of these different things can communicate with each other, right? So you can spawn like application level events or module uh, related events without knowing or coupling. Um, those concerns directly into methods. Like you're not going to call methods directly in Marionette. You're going to publish events, and then you're going to have other things that are wired up to listen to those events. So things can happen in in a completely decoupled, uh, in a completely decoupled fashion. So even if you're not using a large scale app, even if you wanted to do a one task app, Marionette is going to be able to give you all that infrastructure. You will honestly write less code than if you were to do it in Backbone. And it's going to be immediately scalable. When you want to add more parts to it, when you want to add another function, you're just going to do that in the same way that you added the first. And everything is going to build alongside of, of one another. And you're not going to have to go back and rethink your entire application or rescale it from the ground up or anything like that. It, it totally solves all these solutions, all these problems. So I want to actually, you know, we've talked about conceptual type stuff, but I wanted to like show real world examples. So now after seeing Pam's talk and seeing how awesome this projector is, I'm actually disappointed that I didn't show like more code like before and after, but I was like uncertain how well that would come off. And I write coffee script and I know that has like a polarizing effect on everyone that loves like <laughs> parentheses and curly braces, right? <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, so uh, so visually visually let's go through like the, the applic the application and how all these things fit together. So as you can see, like we have like a uh, 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 like a canvas, right? We've got our, our, our Chrome at the top, and this would represent like the container of our application. And Marinette has the application object, right? It's the starting central hub that you know uh, encapsulates and namespaces your application. So you know, no, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, you know global uh, variables attached to the window. This is going to be you know its own uh, application object, and everything within it is going to live by itself, right? So this allows us to set up like initial configuration, maybe, hey, when this app kicks off, do this, configure it with that, you know, things, things that, that, are, that are critical. Like, um, like I use, I use um, I'll attach things to the application object that orchestrate communication that, you know, the whole app needs to facilitate. Like, if I am going to do a, uh, uh, 
if I, if I want to just like <coughs> make sure that the server is still up or something like every every 60 seconds, I would probably write a method and attach it directly to the application object. So if something went down, it'd be able to handle it kind of like on the on the on the on the, on the, on the lowest piece, right? The base component. Anyway, so uh, probably the, the biggest thing that you know, you guys can take out of this is that an application allows you to define your app's primary regions. And this is like literally, you know, uh, Pam was talking about regions, and in Marionette, it's literally called the same thing. So application regions are ways that we can tie uh, DOM elements to like a JavaScript object. So like a typical application, right, you've got your header region, You've got your main region where everything is going to be moving in and out of. That's the thing that's going to be dynamic and it's going to change all the time. And for illustration, I just like put a footer region, whether or not you have it. So you, with, with Marinette, you would, you would define these regions on your application object, right? And regions uh, are what hold views. Views get inserted into regions and regions will, will manage them. And that's how, that's how like automatic cleanup happens. So when I say I want this view or, or you know specialized view type to go in the main region when I want something else to go in there it's gonna you know kill the old view that was in there makes sense it's like how transitions happen and uh, we can do, we can do all sorts of awesome things with with regions that I've actually been uh, experimenting with so like you can set custom region objects in Marionette so I can have like a custom set of code that says anytime that something goes into the main region I want whatever was in there to fade out or slide up or slide down or slide left, whatever. And when it, when something else comes in there, I want it to do a new you know transition too. So you can build really really responsive, um, interesting types of effects. And we that's exactly where we'd want to do it. We want to do it in the place that's that's managing the insertion and removal of those types of views. Okay. So moving along. Um, the next biggest thing, and this is uh, this is like. Uh, talk about all the time in JavaScript is it, modules, right? So modules are like groups of related code that are kind of like disconnected from other modules and they're grouped together and they're usually under like a different name space. So in this case, like I've inserted or I'm using modules uh, as sub-applications. Like even though I have my application object where everything is going to live at, things that actually do that do things are usually modules and I'll name them like appropriately as so. so uh, I would have like a header app and a footer app, and I would have you know inserted those and paired them with those types of regions. And modules, like applications, can have like their own initial configuration. They can be shut down or started up at any time. So you can say, when my app stop, starts, obviously I need a header and a footer. So anytime it starts, those need to immediately run and attach themselves and, and, and put them and put these uh, put themselves in, in these regions, right? And modules can have unlimited numbers of submodules, which won't really make much sense right now, but we'll get into that in a, will in a second. Um, so notice I've, uh, I've done something right here. So this is like, you know, the kickoff, like, okay, so we've visited this URL up here, right? Like, you know, hashtag users. And, you know, being RESTful, this is obviously going to display, this is going to fetch um, a list of users, and uh, we're going to want to display those. So a layout is a way for us to do that. And um, so in this case, like I've inserted a new module, right? I have like my users app, which is obviously, you know, uh, there to manage all of uh, the user CRUD actions, right? And in this case, this is a submodule. So this is the list submodule of users app that's responsible for getting and displaying a list of, list of users. So it's, 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 uh, it's pretty simple. And in this case, like I've highlighted this because Users app would probably, you know, be a layout of some sort. So you know, like the layout gets inserted into the main region, as 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 we remember, and you can define regions on a layout. And we've already talked about regions. Regions can be attached directly to the application, things that really aren't going to change. And you can have unlimited amounts of regions attached to a layout. And this is why we're able to build extremely complex views, right? It's it's really the same pattern over and over and over again. So in here, let's just say you know I've I've I've, I've kind of set up primed ourselves to have like three different uh, regions in the in, in this layout, and this is going to allow us to manage uh, nested view, uh, nested views. So uh, and then the same can be true about these uh, region objects. Like these could be 
custom. They could have like special transitions or spinners. They could say, hey, you know, look at the view that's coming in here. And if this views if this views entity, like if its model or collection hasn't been synced yet or hasn't been fetched, I want you to show a spinner. And the moment that it is synced, I want you to remove that and I want you to actually insert the view. Totally trivial with, with, with Marionette. Very simple to, to augment. So kind of already talked about this, but basically like this is where I've actually defined these regions. So this is obviously like a div ID panel region, uh, div ID aside region, div ID table region. So I've created these three regions. I've assigned them into my layout. And now I'm actually ready to insert views in, in, into these regions. So of course, like I already said, it's kind of like uh, Russian dolls, right? Like if I just swapped out this regions view with something else, it would just have cleaned up the one that existed in the table region. Same with this or same with that. But if I had swapped out the entire main region, main region would have closed, it would have closed panel region, it would have closed the side, and it would have closed the table. And it would close it in the sense of detaching it, removing it, and cleaning up and unbinding everything with it. So, I mean, this is like, this is, if I knew this 10 months ago, I probably would be a million. So, all right. So we have we have item views, right? So this is like the first like specialized view type, right? And an item view does really exactly what it says, right? It manages a single resource, a single entity, one module or one collection. So right here, for instance, like when our header app started, I probably would have had an item view that managed the header's template. And in this case, even though it's pointing to the logo, it's not like it would have represented just one singular um, element or whatever. It would have probably represented, you know, everything that's that's around here. I'm just showing you, like, that is how that logo would have gotten there. And like in this panel region, right, the thing that sits on top of our table probably would have had an item view, and the item view would have had like, you know, a template that said, hey, maybe maybe count all the users that's in our collection or or you know uh, we've got this add new user button so this this one item view that's in the panel region would, would automatically be, be wired up to listen for um, you know click events on this on this add new user button and we'll get into more about like um, how it, you know it would have published this event and how it's able to communicate with everything else because that is like a degrees as well um, some really cool things about item views is remember, like I said, rendering is automatically taken care of, right? So when this item view was inserted into that panel view, the panel view automatically called the render method and automatically um, inserted it. It automatically called like collection to, to JSON or, or model to JSON. And that's that's cool because that that's the same thing that happens every time. We don't we don't care about that. But item views offer us lots of like life set lifecycle methods and events that are easy to work on. Things like on render. So you could say when this is rendered, now run my custom code. Or on show. Because it might have been rendered, but it might have not actually have been shown yet. So you could say, well on, on show do do something else. You have like before close uh, before close um, methods. So like because item views are constantly cleaned up, you could have custom code that you want to have run before it's closed, or on closed, or before render. I mean, there's like lots of these really intelligently well-named um, events that happen through the life cycle of a item view that's really easy to tap into. So instead of having like one giant render method that's responsible for rendering it, closing it, and a million other things, now you have events that are actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that describe what's happening in the item view, and that's obviously where your code would go. So like when when I look at item view code, it is so easy to understand what's going on because of, because of, of, of these conventions. Um, it's also really cool because you can cache and organize UI elements. Um, so like this this button, uh, it probably has like a like an ID of like a, a add new user or something like that. So I would have cached that button on this item view. So instead of like querying the DOM and looking up the button every single time that I want to interact with it, it would have cached it, and then I would have just pulled it out of that out of the cache. Like, it, and it's so simple. It's like this dot UI dot you know new button or something. Super super simple. Uh, super simple. Super awesome. So uh, the next type of specialized view is a uh, composite view. So a composite view is 
is one of the view types that if you pass it in a collection, it will automatically iterate over all the models in that collection and create new item view instances for those things. And as you kind of would expect, you know, a collection view is probably, you know, going to need reset, add, and remove events, right? So when you add new models for it, it wants to show those. When, you, when it removes, it wants to take those away. And then when the reset event is called on the collection after it's been fetched, you probably want the whole view to come in all together. So all that is intelligently handled. It's automatically wired up. Of course, you can unbind those. You can change those. You can augment those. But it kind of handles the conventions for you, right? So in this case, like this composite view, um, what's, what's also interesting about it is that a composite view, even though it iterates through and creates item views, um, it, it supports a template. So like this is a table, and obviously like we would have had like a T head up here, right? Like a T body, or I'm sorry, a T foot down there, or something else. And we really want like our item views to go inside the T body when when they're actually iterated on. So that's what a composite view does. It like it so easily you know, supports this. So like this would be an example of like you know obviously I've said like hey our collection has three users. So once those users are fetched and they come back. There's one, there's two, there's three. So that's how it works. And each of these independently would be item views. So they can be managed and then they can be bound to you know, UI elements and different events and everything else. And like I said earlier, you know, the, the composite view that's responsible for managing these is automatically you know, wired up to these add or remove. So if I had a delete button and I clicked it, this row would go away. Okay, so the, the other, the counterpart to a composite view is a collection view. Um, it has all the traits of a composite view, but it doesn't have uh, like an exterior template. It just simply iterates over uh, its collection and creates model instances. So like we kind of have it up here, because our header app probably has links, right? And so like if uh, you know we had links, then obviously like they would go in order, you know, one, two, three. So those three links were in our collection view. The collection view was responsible for Fetching, or not for fetching those, but for, for iterating over those and, and creating them. Super simple stuff, right? So the next thing finally getting to is like a like an event aggregator. Because like as we talked earlier, we're like we're breaking out all these all these pieces into like their you know the smallest level possible. So each one only has concerns over what it's actually managing, which is a great thing. And but we're we're gonna need our application to constantly communicate with one another. But the user list, you know, the user list, uh, the user's app list submodule probably shouldn't know anything about like the user's app edit module or the user's app new module. I mean, the, the user's app parent module probably should, but these events are going to be happening in the list, like when we click edit. So Marionette has uh, a built-in event aggregator that allows us to like trigger application level events like all the way to like the parent the the, the the guy that's sitting out there holding everything else or just module level events or some module level events right and um, it's got a, there are a couple different ways to do that and really this is like for semantics but semantics are really important and like in in, um, in marionette you can like issue a command so hey i want you to go do something we're still not calling like methods directly it's just through a command that you would have registered, you know, with this module. So I want you to go do something, or like a pub sub, which basically just means that hey, this thing is automatically published to listen to this event. So anytime that it's fired, I will do something else. Or like request response patterns. So like maybe you know when you click edit, you want to like fire a dialog that sits on top of all these. Well, you would probably want like the user's app list to maybe manage that, so like a request response would be like, go do something and then hand me back a response so that I can work with. And all these are like really easy. And obviously this promotes decoupling our components, our internal infrastructure, and it makes like building really awesome scalable applications super, super possible. At any rate, so we've clicked edit, right? And what's happened is, in this case, we have that item view would have been bound to that, uh, to that link. And when that link was clicked, it would have fired an event that says, hey, the, the, the edit user event happened. And it probably would have bubbled up to a controller. And then that controller would have fired an event or pass it on to like the parent module that said, hey, the edit user was clicked. 
and I'm passing you the model that I already had. Because remember, this was a composite view that already had those models. We don't need to refetch this user, so it passed it out. The user's app module responded, and it did two things. It changed the URL, right? I mean, we, we think it's like backbone developers that like, well, wait a second, when you click that edit link, that would have just been a link, right? It would have just naturally changed the router. No, 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 that, that's the wrong way of thinking. That's kind of like the stateless way of thinking. Because anytime that something hits the router, eventually it's going to go, I mean, it's going to go all the way back up the chain. It's going to hit our app routes, and we're going to have to regenerate everything. Because we still want this to be persistent. Like if I hard link this and send it over to you and you paste it in your browser, you're going to want to get to here, right? But when you're within the app, you don't want to redraw anything. You don't need to redraw the header app and the footer. And, in a trivial example like this, it might not make a lot of sense, but in highly complex uh, systems, it, 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 is, it can make or break the application. So what's cool about this is that you know, the, the user's app would have received this event, and it would have changed the URL to keep this consistent, but it wouldn't have actually fired the routing event. So it never went up to the router. It's just keeping it consistent, so if you do you know, hit Control r or something, Command-R, and refresh, you'll get back here, and that's cool. But it would have obviously sent like a notification to like the edit controller, the edit controller of the edit module. And it would have passed on the, the model and it would have said, you know, go and display. And then the, the user's app edit would have inserted itself in the main region. So everything else that was in our list, all of those, the composite view, all of the item views, the panel, the region, all that got closed down, unbinded, cleaned up, moved on, and this came in in its stead. So I mean, this is this is like this is this is like in, in, incredible stuff. We can we can we can scale out to essentially every any any level with with uh, with these principles. And there there are actually other aspects of Marionette, but you know this is this is kind of like the, the highlights. Um, so at the end of the day, we we've, we've achieved some pretty like astounding uh, astounding things, and we've taken the hardest aspect of building client-side apps and. Um, We've done some really cool things. So we've promoted a lot of like solid principles and design patterns that are already baked into Marionette that just kind of like they don't force you to use it, but they're gonna they're gonna lead you the way, right? Um, this is gonna allow us to like effortlessly scale, factor, and manage our app, right? We don't have to like rethink all of our architecture, we just kind of add on to it, and every piece kind of gets built the same way. Um, it allows us to build extremely high powered, rich, you know, user interfaces that are about data, that are that are data driven and uh, really fast, great user experience. And I really feel like this unlocks like the unlimited potential. Um, this is very close. This definitely like, handles all the things that Ember does, and it is, I would say, a, pretty much like a sister of Ember, um, except you get to use Backbone. And you get to use Backbone for the parts that it's really good at, and, uh, and something else that's gonna take care of the rest. Um, so where do we go from here, right? Uh, I mean, Marionette is uh, actively in uh, development, I mean, it gets updated virtually every single day. There's more and more people that are that are getting onto it. There's more like big players that are starting to use it, like StubHub's. Re re Go ahead. So, <clears throat> I was going to ask about the community. How large is the community uh, behind? Uh, uh, well, I'd like to say huge, but it's uh, it's pretty <coughs> small. I'm pretty small in this, uh, comparatively to Backbone. I mean. Um, there's like a few big players that like sit like the IRC channel, like answer all of your questions. Um, but there's not like that many people. Like it's getting more and more exposure, more and more people are realizing that they have to use it. And Marionette's not the only one for backup. There's like Layout Manager and uh, uh, Chaplin and, and, and a couple of others. But Marionette is absolutely by far the best, most comprehensive and well documented. Um, so that's that's kind of like what, what I'm, I'm about to talk about. So. Like the Marionette documentation is amazing. Like it is, it is way more documentation than than um, than Backbone, and it's a wonderful, wonderful reference. Like anyone with a little bit of experience with it can get in there and read the documentation and know all the different types of events, and you just have so much at your disposal. Um, and the wiki is getting better all the time with bringing in like true like use cases, and I would say that's probably the hardest part about Marionette is that there's so much to do. But building the apps is still really complicated, and there's still, you know, you, if you ask uh, a Marionette developer or a couple of developers how to do one thing, you're still going to get different answers. Conceptually, they're all going to be the same, but there's different approaches. So understanding how how much it offers you and applying it 
to a project is still probably the most difficult. And I will openly admit, like when I moved over to Marionette, I couldn't figure out all the things and how to use it. I was like, I want to do all these things, and some of it is painfully obvious, like layouts and regions and everything, but how do I use my application object? How do I, how do I set up and orchestrate and organize these models? I, I wasn't quite sure. And I got like uh, the chance to actually work and do pair programming with Derek Bailey. In about two days, I understood how to organize my app, and I probably spent about 11 days with him, kind of like going over like, well, now we know how to do it. What is the best possible way? Or making changes to the internet to make certain things easier. Um, so, uh, so anyway, the, the next the next thing I want to talk about is kind of like a, a little little like shameless plug. So I, I realized that 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 knowing that knowing these things is a really powerful thing. It's something that I've wanted to share for a little while now because my whole career is based completely on open source. You know, we're we're a Rails shop. Um, so obviously, I've benefited greatly from all the contributions that a lot of people have made. And I wanted to kind of give back and give back to something I'm passionate about. And I know that can be like really impactful for a lot of people. And as I mentioned earlier, like there are no good backbone demo apps. They're just, they're just, you know, we talked about it earlier, but there's nothing that you can really look at it and see like see how how all these principles can really be applied. So what I wanted to do and what I've been doing like over the last month or so is actually building a real application, right? Like start to finish, like as it goes through its infancy and refactoring it and scaling it. And I went ahead and, and, and I don't know how I got this domain, but I did. Uh, I registered this, I put out a site, and my goal in doing this was to put out like a couple of like introduction videos. And I know like we haven't gone over like any code and really, I mean, showing you like Marionette code, I mean, you know, it's more important that you understand like the high level concepts and then, you know, whether you use CoffeeScript or JavaScript, you can kind of you know, find your way at that. But I go into a lot more detail, a lot more like before and afters, and this is how, you know, it used to look, this is how we do this with Marionette. So there's, so I, I have like some intro stuff, um, and then I actually have like a getting started with Marionette, like how you use the pieces, and, and kind of like my thought process. And those are like the two intro type stuff. And then I've taken this demo app that I wanted to build that you know was um, that I thought like most people could, could understand and appreciate it and sort of and sort of uh, uh, see how that there's like a natural arc to progressing on that with with uh, with Marionette and those I I've actually been building the demo app it's not done yet the demo app has to be done first before I can do screen on how to build it right so those are coming like pretty soon. And I haven't yet like released these. These are completely done. In fact, all the slides and a lot more is from these. Um, and I wanted to get a little bit of feedback before releasing those, but they'll probably be released like this month or whatever. So you can go ahead and go there now. Um, it's free. You know, go ahead and, and check it out. Hopefully, it's helpful. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm trying to talk about this. When I switch over to Marionette from from Backbone, um, it probably quadrupled, if not more, of my productivity. Now I'm able to build incredibly fast, high-powered applications um, with it. So it's something that's uh, that's really, really, really special. So, so that is it. We're done. Yeah. Two questions. One is, uh, when you're in the Marionette layer, how often do you find yourself having to go back down into the backbone, like core backbone stuff, if at all? Well, I mean, it's they're they're like one and the same thing. Like Marionette doesn't change any of the ways that models work or that collection works. It just it just augments it. It's just an abstraction that sits on top of a backbone. So the way that you create new models and you know define them or work with them, all that is exactly the same. It doesn't change anything like that. It just does like easy things for you. Like instead of saying like you know this dot model or bind to model change da da da. Like it provides like a model events hash. So you can just define all your model events in one hash or collection events if you have that. It makes like it makes it much easier to work with that. It doesn't it doesn't really touch the model layer at all because that, that's the best part about backbone. That's that's phenomenal. That's why we're able to even build stuff with it. Uh, it doesn't doesn't need to really be augmented. And of course, this isn't going to keep you from using any backbone plugin. I mean, we use backbone relational, backbone query, backbone memento, tons and tons of plugins that that all do different things works wonderfully well. And my second question is. How are you testing this? What testing framework do you use? So testing is a whole whole other topic. Um, so we do like uh, integration tests and stuff in Rails. 
So that's like how I'm testing this. I don't like have tests for the framework. It is well tested. Um, I should probably have like model tests, but we just don't. The thing about client stuff is that, you know, if you do have like a lot of like specific custom logic like in your models, it is definitely good to write tests for that. Um, but it's usually like really obvious when something doesn't work. So, in so much that I, we've gotten away without doing like any type of jobs for testing. The testing we do is like integration tests and making sure that UI functions, you know, when you click search, you get search results, things like that. Um, if uh, you know, we're like a one-man show that does all this, if I had other developers, we'd definitely be doing this. No question about it. Your, um, your backbone rails. So um, I'm mostly a back-end developer. Mm -hmm. um, what to what I'm hearing is that Backbone is primarily the entire app. So, other than a RESTful API, what do you actually use Rails for when you merge the, when you're using the two together? That's a great question, and I'm super passionate about that side as well. You know, not everyone here is not going to be a Rails developer, but um, I mean, uh, the the Rails side of it is just purely uh, consumes JSON. So. And we use like the asset pipeline. So like instead of using, even though there is like an AMD version of Marionette, like we don't use that. I, I could rant about AMD. And I'm not a Rails person, so all that okay. jargon means nothing to me. So well, the back end is still going to have to coordinate, and organize, concatenate, and unify all your JavaScript files. So it still plays like a large role in. So in, it's an API. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that's what the back end becomes. Okay. It becomes a pure API, but it's still responsible for it's managing a large part of like the dependencies sorry. and things like that potentially that are in JavaScript. And uh, and you need to have like a really great like JSON uh, you know, gem or something that's going to be able to pull out JSON. So I think we're actually a little, I mean, I'm like, I think three minutes. I probably told you I would go over 45. I was going to show the demo app, but I don't know if I have time. But it kind of shows like what's, what's possible in just like a day or two. Yeah. Yeah, Brian, one no, other thing that's worth mentioning is um, the Marionette components are loosely coupled, and you don't have to use them all. Yeah, it's composite. Right. That's, that's, so that's the biggest thing. In particular, the module system and the application object, I, I don't use them at all. And it's primarily a, a view kit, an excellent view kit for the views and the events. Right. So, so it's not a monolithic thing that you have, you're forced oh, yeah. to adopt. You, you don't have to use all of it. It's, it's all going to be yeah, completely decoupled from one another. It doesn't require you. Is there any UI finding uh, besides? I mean, clearly, I guess the 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 the, uh, the view the um, the collection views would be bound to collections. But what about just ordinary uh, labels and, and and fields and so forth? Is there is it either backbone or Marionette do any of that? So um, I mean, it gets completely away uh, out of your way when it comes to like templating, since all that is like the actual like DOM level type stuff. I have tons of customized, very specific, specialized views as well that like manage that. Like what what um, what what she said about like creating like specialized views that, that manage like forms and everything like that becomes really trivially easy with Marionette, and that's that would be what you would do with that. And that's obviously it's not something that's part of the core. It's something you can add on at any, any time. So that's probably one approach. There's, there's actually quite a few uh, backbone plugins that can do like data binding and, or uh, backbone forms, things like that. Uh, because because like like item views that have so much more like segmented types of of events like on show or before render, I find it really easy to use like uh, third party components like jQuery UI and Kendo UI because I can put like the logic that's associated with them like in the exact place where it's supposed to be. So views can do what they're good at manage the view and respond to DOM elements and click events and stuff that are happening just in what it's managing. It makes all that super, super simple. Okay. All right, well, I mean, the, the demo app is for some other times. Thanks again to, to Pamela. Um, really appreciate both of you giving really awesome rounds of stuff. Um, so just a couple of things. We had a lot of people kind of come up to Toby and myself saying that their companies were um, in dire need of uh, JavaScript ninja type people. 
Um, so we wanted to give just a, a couple minutes if anybody here is one of those people to just sort of raise their hand and give us like a 30 second blurb um, about what your company is looking for. And um, if you're a technical recruiter, we'd ask that you post on our uh, meetup site the, uh, the job board, which is going to be the best way to really reach out to um, to our community. So is there anybody here representing a company uh, that is looking for in-house people? Go ahead. All right, my name is Rob Holland, I'm the development team lead for Scone, that way down the street. And uh, we're building the next okay. generation of auditing tools, which brings in like $7 billion of revenue every year for the company. And the front end is going to be in a client side rendering tool, possibly like Backbone. So uh, interested in, uh, we have two opportunities, one's a contracting position, one's a full time. So um, I have cards, come find me if you're interested. And uh, it's going to be it's the biggest project happening at that firm. So it's a monumental effort and it takes some uh, very smart people to go for 18 type, type of guys. So if you're interested, you know, reach out, please. Yeah, Ernst & Young, not a, not a shabby place to work. So. Yeah. Hey, this is Steve Fraser. Um, I'm the technology director at CNN Turner. We have some needs just for CNN in the web development world, contract and firm. And then Turner more broadly is you know, uh, moving a lot into the JavaScript space even with some of our tools, our CMS tools, which I think this sort of application, uh, presentation really uh, speaks to. So if anyone's interested, just uh, talk to Turner or talk to me directly. Very good. Cool. <coughs> All right, we'll start up here. Hey, I'm uh, Dave Merrill. I work at uh, IBM up in Sandy Springs. And you know when I say IBM, you probably think I should be wearing a tie, but this is actually how I went to work today. And I work from home a lot too, so. You know, no real dress code as far as our office is concerned, but it used to be legacy internet security systems. We were acquired by IBM back in uh, 2007, and we have a web front end to our security appliances, which uses a lot of Dojo, a lot of jQuery, Backbone, Ruby Rails, all sorts of fun stuff. So we're hiring two. I've got a uh, message in the message board, so if anybody's looking for something, feel free to contact me. Very cool, and then Everyone, my name is Tom O'Day. I have a well-funded startup called Rocket Whale. Uh, we're looking for one to two developers to work on our client project. We're building the flagship customer-facing app for a extremely well-funded company out in uh, the Valley. They've raised over $75 million. They do over $50 million of funding at, or in revenue every year. Uh, it's a very challenging project. Uh, Rails, MySQL, ESTJS4, uh, we'd love to bring someone in and help them grow to do front end and back end work. Our corporate culture is fun people that get shit done, so if that's <coughs> you or, and you're up for the challenge, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, Tom at rocketwell.com or rocketwell.com, thank you. Very cool. Yeah, I'm uh, Andy Bachelor from Target Digital from the Application Services Division. Um, other Target guys, raise your hand if you us here. So uh, oh. you know, all cool guys are in the team. The same things we work work, the same kind of deal. Uh, probably deal with the loyalty programs at radio stations. And uh, well, radio stations are our biggest company of any kind of media property. Uh, things like uh, earning points for doing things, and then using your points to buy things, stuff like that. Also have uh, online streaming players, that kind of thing. So uh, we're definitely looking at heavy JavaScript implementations. Uh, running Node.js on the server side now, and have experience looking at that parts. So very cool, very cool. Any, anyone else? All right. Um, I must say I'm impressed with the opportunities that we have here, just in this room, um, let alone the city. So it's a great place to be when uh, when you're a developer looking for work. And again, if uh, you know any recruiters that are asking you where can I advertise positions, you know, point them to the uh, to the meetup uh, job board, um, just so that they can be there for the individuals that need them, and they're not sort of overbearing on uh, on what we're trying to do here. Uh, so. I guess with that, we'll go ahead and close and take the uh, take the party and the mingling and the networking and the future job connections to uh, Yard House, which is here in Atlantic Station. Um, it's that way, then that way, then that way. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, and if you don't, well, I'm sorry. No. Um, I usually would show a map, but it's kind of, uh, it's all right. But if you don't have a smartphone and you're going to have trouble finding your way there, just uh, find me or, or Toby over there in the, in the over there by the camera. Um, and we can definitely help you. And that does make me remember one more thing, to thank not only our speakers, uh, Brian and Pamela, but also everybody that helps out to, to do this. So obviously we have Ogilvy with the space, the food, the drinks, the staff, 
um, all that. We've got Toby who does the whole workshop thing. He does a lot of like 90% of setting up the speakers and making sure that they're on point, ready to go. Uh, we've got Logan who has uh, been helping us videotape a lot of this stuff. We have Chris who stood downstairs today and helped us um, let people up after seven o'clock. Uh, there's a lot of you guys that, that do stuff and we really appreciate it. And if you want to get involved, again, the email address is present at atlantajavascript.com or just come up to me with me or Toby. Um, so anyway, thank you guys so much for coming out and we'll see you in uh, November.